Hi, I'm Bruce Waltuck. I am here as uh, they like to say a discussant or a disruptive speaker. I'm here to follow in a panel session after my friend David Snowden's keynote tomorrow morning and I'm here to help amplify and, and expand on the ideas of how an understanding of the dynamics of complex systems applies to the work of making sense and decision and getting better action and outcomes in the work of global economic development. Dave Snowden, I created a company called Cognitive Edge about 10 years ago when I left IBM. We really exist to apply natural science into social systems, in particular a, a field which I call cognitive complexity, which is a combination of complex adaptive systems theory and cognitive neuroscience. Um, I'm here to speak tomorrow morning about some of that work, particularly some of its contrasts with systems thinking, um, and I see complexity is very different from systems thinking. So part of what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow is, is not a process of reflective listening or a personal reflection. It's a process of allowing interactions over multiple agents, over multiple fields, to understand what people really need in Africa and Asia, not what we think they should have, and that's going to be a key emphasis tomorrow. I think the other problem is if you look from a complex systems point of view, you, you want to allow patterns to emerge from interactions over time, over multiple actors. Now, an approach re which requires reflection privileges those with the time for reflection. Yeah. And if, if I'm being really brutal about this, I actually think it's a new form of post-colonialism um, in that it doesn't permit people to speak in their own voice because now the weight and nature of their voice is determined by somebody's particular ideology and the cases are chosen to back up their ideology. For me, it, it took them a while to really get to anything that I thought was of substance. I, I did kind of like the notions about um, um, the, the habits of thought and action and so on, but I, I agree with you that there's nothing particularly challenging or disruptive in this. It, it's, to me, it was somewhat limited, um, and I wish that Peter would go beyond just talking about systems uh, where, where the, the whole tradition and literature um, is, is the mechanistic view. They talk about levers and lever pullers as change agents somehow aside and apart from the systems that they're trying to, to work on. It doesn't work that way as we know. Um, and, and he also, um, when he was talking about culture um, and, and a little bit about intention, I thought, well, I, I would like to have heard more about the constraints and the boundaries um, that, that so closely define what everybody is in. It's great, as you say, to have the time to reflect, but what about those things that, that simultaneously both constrain or confine and also enable? They are simultaneously the sources of opportunity to innovate and to make change. There's all these people who, uh, I know so many people who want to be change agents for good. And I, it, just as you said initially about uh, Peter's remarks, you can't disagree with that sort of universal stuff. Neither can I challenge the people who want to do good things in the world, but don't ha have as deep an understanding of how change really happens. It's an interesting match. So we, we've just done a, a, a two controlled tests for UNDP, where we've taken stories told and interpreted into a quantitative framework in the field in mm -hmm. Africa and in Eastern Europe. And we've chosen stories which are, are commonly correlated by the people who created them. Yeah. So th th there's obviously a strong yeah. attractor pattern there. We then presented them to experts in, in um, Vienna, in Washington, in The Hague, in London, asked them to interpret it the way they think they would have been interpreted in the field. And they, they actually are tightly correlated as well. Yeah, one would it's think. just a zero correlation between the two groups. Yeah. And what's interesting, this matches up stuff we've seen anecdotally, is the, the interpretation from experts is instrumentalist. It actually describes what needs to be done for these people. Whereas their, their stories are indexed based on how they see their life as a, as a more composite whole. Now I think That is to say the interpretation and meaning ascribed by the people who gave the stories. It's descriptive, yeah. or it's yeah. not instrumentalist. Yeah. Now I think, you know, starting to say we need to reflect all this stuff is actually another instrumentalist approach. And what we need to start to do is look at what are the natural patterns, the natural attractors in people's own stories? Yeah. And what small things can we do to enforce them? which don't require us to make judgments about what is or is not the right way of thinking. And it, it, to me, it, it, it reflects the power of the notion that we want or prefer systems that are predictable, stable, right. and controllable. Yeah. It, it's that incredible power of that magnet, 300 plus years of Newtonian or Cartesian thinking that says, well, we've done so much and achieved so much in the world, 
and done so much good. We went to the moon because we figured out how to do that. And yet we can't solve this. And so we set goals and measures and we see this in economic development. Uh, Evidence-based practice is the huge mantra. And if I'm going to give you millions of dollars, yes, I want to know what you did with the money and I want to be able to measure the outcome. And yes, implicit in that is the understanding or the presumption that we understand the causality. That by knowing, that by doing what we said we were going to do, we're going to get what we intended to get, and then we puzzle ourselves endlessly. The reality is we, we need to understand specialization and we need to create generalists, and that requires disciplined education. It's not just about experience. And again, I think this is the big problem I've got with this, this, attempt, is this constant attempt to create dichotomies in which one thing is good and the other thing is bad, and everything which those guys did before you is bad, and now everything we've now come up with is good. And it's actually, all about it's, fear. It's the essence of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, is there's nothing wrong with process re-engineering. There's nothing wrong with rigid manufacturing control for systems for which it's appropriate. This attempt to create the universal prescriptive, and that, that's why I'm calling it post-colonialism. Mm. Yeah? It doesn't matter what ideology it comes from. It's the idea there is a universal solution which is basically flawed. Well, right. It, it, it's, it, it's always based on that same presumption, which to me is driven by that strong desire for a system yeah. and a situation that is predictable, knowable, you know, all that kind of thing. This to me is the big problem, the big difference between complexity thinking and systems dynamics, and they should not be subsumed generally under systems thinking. In com systems dynamics is always set in an ideal future state and trying to close the gap. Ah. It doesn't matter whether it's ideologically or in practice. Absolutely. Complexity thinking says we've got to describe the present more accurately. Then we've got to work out what we can change in the present and where we could amplify success or dampen failure. So we've got to maintain a dynamic agility yeah, to manage the evolutionary potential of the present in real time. Exactly. I talk about the continuous inquiry, continuous yeah. attention to what's happening, um, the need to, as, ne as necessary, shift and adjust the compass heading. Where are we headed? Where, what is our theory? Um, that, to me, is one of the problems with this whole evidence-based notion. And so just one last point, really, that I would want to make, maybe two. Um, what I have seen in over 30 years of working with organizations is what I now call the single biggest mistake, capital S, capital B, capital M, or whatever, which is leaders and change agents treating what are the truly complex challenges that they face as if they were merely technical or complicated, as if they knew the causal relationships between what they were going to do in interventions and the results that they were able to achieve, and then being mystified when things don't work out the way that they do. That goes hand in hand with the second last bit I'll mention here, which is the reliance heavily in grant making on evidence-based practice, and to take a look at close look at what in fact are the high degrees of variation in what you call evidence and then what you call practice and instead take a look at its converse the notion of ev uh, excuse me practice based evidence which dir relates directly to the kind of sense making through narrative fragment that Dave talks about I think in terms of way forward I think there's there's a massive shift all right and the shift is a conceptual shift to dealing with perpetual uncertainty a point that Brian Arthur makes really yeah. well from Santa Fe, that even science doesn't find the idea of perpetual novelty, you know, it, it's not easy to handle, yeah. but the reality is that's the world. It's the way we, it's the way we grow up with our kids, so we yeah. shouldn't be that surprised. Now, there are three basic principles for managing a complex adaptive system. One is you have to deal with finely grained objects, not too fragmented, but not too structured, yeah, because then it, they can combine and recombine together in novel ways. Yeah? We then need to distribute cognition, so the process of interpretation, the power of interpretation, has to distribute across whole networks and not just be owned by experts in Washington or The Hague or London or wherever. And thirdly, a key concept called disintermediation, decision makers, which includes people in the field making decisions about their own condition as well as people in Washington making decisions about investment, need to be in direct contact with the raw narratives of people without interpretive layers because the interpretive layers filter out things they need to pay attention to. So if I look at some of the work we're now starting to do experimentally, um, although it's always been difficult with people like USA to get them to see their projects within this wider setting, to be honest, and it's a problem, is you create capability before you need it. So you create distributed sensor mm -hmm. networks, which will feed stuff back out in real time, so as you start to intervene, you can see the response mechanism. 
Now, actually, ironically, that's cheaper than most current development efforts. So, for example, getting all the schools in an area of Africa, giving them smartphones and getting them to act as distributed ethnographers into their communities to gather stories every month is an easy thing to do. That gives you a huge quali quantitative database in which you can measure impact or identify areas for impact. You can then do what's called acceptation, in which ideas, which are also indexed at a fragmented level, are associated in real time between need and, and capability. So those clusters become available to people in the communities and experts to create novel practice. So what you do is you design a system in which novel ideas can emerge and be recognized, rather than deciding, I've got a novel idea, this is how it will be recognized. 